Well, I invite you to turn this morning to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. That your minds are upon the coming of the Son of God into the world. I want to help aid you in your considerations and thoughts at this time of the year. Try and maintain the balance, beloved. Try not to let uh, the time of year become shrouded with things that are merely sentimental or carnal. Uh, we want to take time, and it will be good for you uh, tomorrow morning, perhaps if you have young children, to just take a moment before the chaos of all the presents and so on, uh, and they will, you'll be hard pushed to pull them away from everything uh, after they open all those new gifts and so on, uh, just to take a moment and perhaps read the word to them and pray with them and rejoice together in the great coming of the Lord. But do spend time together. Set your phones aside. Set your laptops aside, whatever. Spend time as a family and uh, just enjoy, if you have time off, just the goodness of God and uh, We'll be trying to do the same as well. Luke chapter 2. We'll read from verse 1 and read through verse 14. Luke 2 verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenus was made governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, into the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, <clears throat> the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Saviour, which is Christ the Lord." And this shall be a sign unto you, ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Amen. May the Lord bless the reading of his word and our meditation on it in just a moment. Let's pray together. Let's all just bow before the Lord and... We need to hear from the Lord today, beloved, and I am not able to do that, but we pray that the Spirit will come and you pray that God will deal with you exactly where you are, and whatever your condition of heart, that you will hear exactly what you need to hear. Our God, we pray for that above all things, that each one will hear what they ought, what is relevant and what is pertinent to their spiritual condition or even their circumstance of life. I pray that it might please thee to pour out thy spirit and to give us alert minds and worshipful hearts. And as we consider what is here revealed for us, that our hearts may be drawn heavenward and even somewhat prepared to truly praise thee at this time of the year as well as at every time of the year. We confess, O oh God, that worship is something that we fail to do to the extent and to the degree that it ought to be offered. Indeed, Lord, we are so selfish. Forgive us our sins. Enable us, even now, to be attuned to praise thee. And may we be moved, even in heart, even as our brother has already prayed, we will be moved by the gospel to understand even what it is to have a greater love for those that are still lost and have no assurance of salvation. So may thy spirit fall on us and encourage us and bless us, and we'll give thee all the glory in Jesus' name. 
Amen. When we come to Luke's account of the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, you will notice how particular he is in laying out the details of the surrounding events in which this particular event took place. You will find from the very outset of this chapter details that are designed for the student of the event, the one who's desiring to understand what is going on, that the context is being laid out for them. He begins in verse 1, it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus. He is named. The emperor of the, of Ro the Roman Empire is given his name and he is named here so that those who would come and study this event, and as Luke specifically is writing this to a man by the name of Theophilus, he is letting Theophilus know a few decades down the line, this is the time. This is the time Caesar Augustus was the emperor of the Roman Empire, and at that time, whenever there was a particular event, and of course, it's recorded here that all the world should be taxed. That was known as well. This is an event that was understood by those in those times when a taxation began to unfold uh, across the empire. And also in verse 2, when he says it actually happened during this time of Cyrenus was governor of Syria, or he was a leader who had some authority in Syria. Again, painting a picture of the context. Luke is giving specific details so that you and I, even coming two millennia later, realize that this is history, that what is happening here is history. You can read about these characters, Caesar Augustus, Cyrenus in Syria. You can read about them. You can learn about them. This whole event of the taxation of the empire, you can read about it. It's not just some mythology that was generated in the mind of Luke to paint a picture. He is drawing from things that were going on in the world and saying, at this time, something occurred that was to change the course of the world forever. Indeed, over seven centuries prior, one of the prophets by the name of Micah, in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, records this, But thou, Bethlehem Ephratah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. So even over seven centuries prior, we find the prophet being sent to be specific about where the Messiah will come, in Bethlehem. And of course, things have to occur over the course of those seven centuries to bring this to pass. Indeed, there has to be the very preservation of Bethlehem itself for this to take place. And God is ordering all these things out. The ruler prophesied would not come from Jerusalem, but out of Bethlehem, the city of David, a town about six miles outside the city of Jerusalem. And as the day approaches, God is ordering all things, the entire world, to align to this event. Mary, the vessel of God's choosing to bring Jesus into the world that we looked at last Lord's Day morning, she lives in Nazareth. And God has to get Mary from Nazareth to Bethlehem to fulfill the prophecy and to make sure everything is done as was declared. So how does he do it? How does he do it? He impacts the lives of everyone in the Roman Empire to make it happen. God calls the mightiest ruler on the earth at that time to commence a taxation of the empire that will cause Mary to be forced with Joseph to go from Nazareth, a 70 mile journey to Bethlehem, to be taxed. That's how God's going to do it. And that's what he does. He is in control. He is governing over all affairs. This is not coincidence. This is not unfolding just by hap and chance. God didn't say and declare through his prophet over seven centuries prior, Messiah will be born in Bethlehem and then choose a vessel that's in Nazareth and then have her move 70 miles to Bethlehem to bear uh, the Savior into the world and give birth to him all by chance. He is ordering this, beloved. And there's a marvel, marvelous revelation of the utter and total sovereign power of God here 
If we would only read between the lines and realize what is going on, as Luke reveals all these details and is getting us to think that all these details that are recorded in secular history and happened and people are aware they occurred, he's getting them to realize God was governing at all so that the Savior would be born at the right time, the right place. Indeed, Paul later records in Galatians chapter 4, when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem us who were under the law. When the fullness of the time, there's a time, there's a place, there is an unfolding of all the details, and God is ordering every one of those details. I trust the Lord will give us more grace to take this in. God can cause Caesar, Augustus, Caesar, tax the empire. Because by that, I will get Mary where I need her to be. What power the Lord exercises. And of course, this great power is also exercised in various ways that we might be surprised at. He could have exercised his power also to provide grand lodgings for Mary and Joseph, but that doesn't take place. Far from it. They arrive in Bethlehem some time before he is to be born. As we're told in verse 6, so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. So for some time that they are there. The likelihood is not what you usually see in the nativity scenes where Joseph and Mary arrive just in time and they go to the door of an innkeeper and they knock on the door and the innkeeper comes and says, there's no room, sorry, and they are put into some stable somewhere. That's probably not how it works and how it unfolds. What is most likely is Joseph has family there. And Joseph makes a journey early in the pregnancy, or at least early su sufficiently that he's not worried about Mary giving birth on the journey. I mean, it's 70 miles, whether it was by donkey or not, again, we're not told. But by whatever means they got from Nazareth to Bethlehem, 70 miles in those days would take some time. And they get there, and Joseph's sensible enough, he'll get there in time, and they go, and they get probably with family. And they're there with family, living with family, but in the family, the word we are told there in the inn, there's no room for them in the inn, is guest chamber, otherwise translated in other places of scripture. And the idea mostly is that there was no place in the guest chamber for them. Maybe there was other family members, other individuals that were there. Whatever reason, the guest chamber, maybe the family themselves stay there. I don't know. But they go and they stay in a place where the animals would have been put, maybe at night time, certainly during the winter time, in the lower level of the home, brought in there and stayed. There's no room in the guest chamber, so they're put into another part of the house where the animals would have stayed and where the Lord Jesus finds himself being placed in a manger. But the point, the point is that the Lord is governing over these details. He is moving the emperor to tax the world, to get Mary there, and with all of that, still doesn't make a grand place for the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is going to be born in humility. And by that, we will all be able to relate to him. And we will understand that he wasn't born to be something beyond us with regard to our humanity, but to take our humanity and to sympathize with every last one of us, being bone of our bone and flesh of our flesh and understanding what it is even to be in the lowest state of life. As we come to consider some of the language that's expressed here in the midst of the appearance of the angel to the shepherds and the sign that was given to them. There's just a few things that I want to leave with you. And we're considering it under the heading, glory to God and peace to men by the birth of Jesus. Glory to God and peace to men by the birth of Jesus. First, note with me that the birth of Jesus was announced. It was announced. Verse 11, we are told in verse 11, for unto you is born this day. And again, take note of that. This day, what day? A day when all these other things are going on when there's a taxation going on, whenever uh, Cyrenus is governor in Syria, and this, at this time, but there's then this specific day, in the midst of all of that, there's this specific day. Again, it's not mythology. This is happening in history. It's happening in time. It's happening in this world. God is coming into the world on a day, the same way you come into the world on a day. And you remember it, it's your birthday. And of course, it's very unlikely that the Lord was born on the day that we will consider tomorrow, the 25th of December, highly unlikely. 
And so, I suppose, I was just thinking about this. People get offended that others forget their birthday or get come to them with a card or a present on the wrong day of their birthday and they might be offended. Just think about the Lord Jesus who's offended every year because we remember at a time that probably isn't his actual day of his birth. But he's not offended, of course not. It's not about that. But he comes on a day. He comes into the world. And this is what is announced. This is what is declared by the angel. Onto you, onto you, not onto God, not onto some heavenly beings, but onto you. The angel comes to say, Onto you is born this day in the city of David again, a place, a place that was known, a place that was there, Bethlehem by name, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. A Savior. Why is he called a Savior? Because he is coming to save. We mentioned this last week. We mention it again because you can't deal with the incarnation without considering the whole purpose and mission for his coming. Why did he come? Why is he here? For a mission to save. And so we are told in Luke 19 verse 10, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. So when they are declaring, the angel declares to them that Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior that is then unfolded that he is coming to save those that are lost, obviously. As elsewhere said in John chapter 3, verse 17, God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved, might be saved, rescued, delivered, brought out of the doom and destruction that they are facing. 1 Timothy 1.15, Paul writes, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Matthew 1.21, Joseph is told, Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Salvation. Salvation. This is why he's come, and this is why it's announced before these men that he is a savior. Look at it, verse 11. Unto you is born this day in the city of David a savior. A savior. Now, if you don't feel you need saved, that doesn't bring any comfort to you. It doesn't encourage you at all. But if you feel you need saved, if you feel you need rescued, if you understand the weight of your own sin before God, then the the knowledge, the, the, the announcement that he is to be a savior is immensely encouraging. Oh, I trust we all get it. Of course, later on in the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, as he began his ministry in Mark chapter 2, where there were those on that occasion that asked, why does this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? Why does he speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? And then you go on and you read the Lord Jesus takes that position. He says, I am come, the Son of Man has come to forgive sins. Yes, by implication declaring he is God come in the flesh. He has that right to forgive sins. He has come to be a savior. That is to save, to forgive sins, to deliver those who are under the bondage and curse of what their sins deserve. So at any time when we remember the incarnation, which I trust is more regularly than once a year, but given that our minds are there at this time of the year, I draw your mind to remember it and realize that at the heart of the incarnation is Jesus' mission to save, to save. And that is what is announced by the angel. A savior, a savior. He is coming to declare it a savior. Oh, if you're a man drowning, if you're a man drowning and you see the lifeguard approach, you realize there's someone that can save me. And you find hope and life and all the panic begins to kind of dissipate as you realize there's one and he sees me and he has come because he has heard my cry. And that's what happens for humanity. Humanity is crying out to be saved, crying out to be delivered, crying out to be redeemed. And the angel comes and says to the shepherds, I'm announcing a Savior has come. This day he has come. And he is Christ the Lord, which is Christ the Lord, verse 11 says, which is Christ the Lord. Christ meaning Messiah, meaning anointed one, meaning in the mind of the Jew, the one promised in all the ages before. He is that one, he is that. The Savior is not a different one than the one promised. He is the one that you've been waiting for. Of course, what encouragement this came, this would come to the hearts of believing Jews, those who were looking for that hope, those like Simeon and like these shepherds, 
perhaps looking for the coming Messiah. And here it is announced in their ears, Christ the Lord. Yes, the Lord. It was prophesied to them to give them encouragement. Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. And Israel looked, believingly they looked for that coming Savior. And now he has come. And just to stand there, it's hard to really take in what it would have been like to go about your business as a shepherd and have this angel come. And this announcement in your ears, unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior. (laughs) What encouragement. And of course, this is encouraging to any sinner in any day who realizes they need to be saved. To realize that unto you, yes, Christmas, think of Christmas this way. Fundamentally, think of Christmas this way, that unto you is born this day a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Do not forget it. In all your traditions, in all your merriment, in all your joy and gladness and exchanging of gifts and delighting in the little ones, in all of that, do not forget. Do not allow to pass from your mind that unto you, is born this day in the city of David, a Savior. So we have the birth of Jesus announced. Secondly, the birth of Jesus should be appreciated. It should be appreciated. I'll read verse 12, but that's not our emphasis. Verse 12 says, And this shall be a sign unto you, ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. This is what you'll see. And suddenly, after that, suddenly, there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Upon announcing that there is to be this coming Savior, which is Christ the Lord, the angel is joined with a multitude of other heavenly beings to reflect upon what this announcement really means. And I thought about that as I was considering this for this morning, that Here you have an individual declaring, and this is as close as angels get to declaring the gospel. This is it. This is as far as they get. A savior is born. (laughs) They don't get to express the gospel the way we do. They don't. God uses sinners to express the gospel, to declare the gospel to other sinners. But on this occasion, this is as close as they get. Unto you is born this day in the city of David a savior. And as soon as that is announced, it can't be left there with the angel merely declaring that. Upon the reflection of that language, he is joined with a multitude of the heavenly host. As I thought about that, I considered how, even in our declaration of the gospel, that is done as an individual to another, to maybe a group, maybe another individual, one to one or one to a group, we declare truth as I am doing now. But to reflect on that truth, to consider that truth, to meditate on that, is not for an individual, it is for a multitude. It's always for a multitude that so it is in heaven. There aren't little individual places of worship. It's the whole host of sinners gathered in from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. They all gather in to praise the Lamb. And so it is here on earth. We gather, we assemble as a corporate body, as a people identified as those who love the Lord Jesus Christ and have embraced Him as Savior and King. And we come together to express that. What is it to declare it on our own? Oh, it may be to some degree a blessing to be on our own thanking the Lord, but it's a far greater blessing if understood correctly that God gathers us together with others to express it in unison and praise them. And that's what the angels do, isn't it? They come to join with the, this other angel. They cannot be reflected upon on their own. There must be a multitude of the heavenly host to praise God and say this. They must all come together. But what is their reflection? What did they consider? They did consider this, that there is something which is ever to ascend to God because of that which ever descends from God. Glory to God because of peace to men. God being glorified, man receiving peace. Glory to God in the highest. That's going up. That's what's to be done. The reflection of unto you is born this day in the city of David, a Savior. What are we to reflect upon? Glory to God. 
and peace to men. This is the heart of the whole thing. This is what the incarnation is all about, giving glory to God, receiving peace as men. That's what it is. What is it if it's not that? If it's merely some time to be sentimental, to have certain traditions and to maybe come to church because it's Christmas and that's what some do. They only go to church at Christmas, maybe Easter. That's what they do. Okay, don't want to get too condemning about that, but at the same time, there ought to be praise that comes from our hearts continually because of the reality of the incarnation. The incarnation really should stimulate praise at all other seasons of the year, as should the cross. That Christ came should cause us to rejoice. And so this is what God is worthy of. Glory to God. That's what the angels come to educate man and tell him, look, this is what it's all about. Glory to God. This is the only thing we are to do. Give glory to God and then to receive peace from God. Yes, glory to God in the highest. This is contrasted and it's a parallelism that's being drawn here. It's it's contrasted with men on the earth. Glory to God in the highest. He's up there where men aren't and men are down here where God isn't. At least that's the implication. And so we are to lift up our minds and draw our minds heavenward to where God dwells rather than where man dwells. We are to elevate our minds to the origin of the gift. That's what the angels are instructing. Glory to God in the highest. Ye men, lift up your minds heavenward. Ye men, look upward. Ye men, consider. The gift has come from above. Look up. Glory to God in the highest. No man could give such a gift. It's exclusively of heavenly origin. Furthermore, I want you to think of something here that may have amazed the angels, and I think most certainly amazed the Apostle Paul. Of this one that is born, of this one that is born, The Apostle Paul later writes in Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, he says, for by him, that's Jesus Christ, for by him were all things created, all things, by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, in other words, it doesn't matter what it is, all things were created by him and for him and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Now I want you to just think about this. Paul's declaring this about Jesus Christ in Colossians chapter 1, the head of the church, the preeminent one over all things. He's declaring that. And the one that is announced, (laughs) the one that is announced, unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. Shepherds, you will go and you will see him found in a manger wrapped in swaddling clothes, swaddled in. That's what you will see. And Paul, this reminds the Colossians 1 to remember remember from that passage that this one in the manger created everything. He ordered everything. Caesar Augustus to tax the empire. And he moved Mary so he would be born in Bethlehem. And he is in control of every detail. When all the times of exile and and the the Assyrians coming in and the the Persians and whatever, the Babylonians rather, coming in and were were threatening uh, Judah and ransacking certain cities, preserving Bethlehem, keeping it there so that centuries later he would be born in that. This is Christ. He is ordering everything. He is in control of it all. That babe in the manger wrapped in swaddling clothes. <laughs> Listen to it again. By him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things and by him all things consist. He is controlling all things. By him all things consist. He is sustaining all things. This is Jesus, the Savior, born in Bethlehem in the city of David, who is Christ the Lord. He is upholding everything at the same time. He is still in a manger. Can our minds fathom it? Can it? 
Glory to God in the highest. <laughs> glory to God in the highest. Oh, if we could only get it. Glory to God in the highest. He is there. Even the Son of Man which is in heaven, he says. He is there. In his essence, as God, he is still there for he is everywhere present. And yet he's also confined to a human frame. Spurgeon said, I think I quoted this last year, but it, it's worth repeating. The Baptist preacher of the 19th century says, infinite and an infant. Eternal and yet born of a woman. Almighty and yet hanging on a woman's breast. Supporting a universe and yet needing to be carried in a mother's arms. King of angels and yet the reputed son of Joseph. Heir of all things and yet the carpenter's despised son. Oh, the wonder of Christmas. Amen. Beloved, we don't get it. We don't get it and we have angelic encouragement and help to try and get it. Glory to God in the highest. Christmas begins with an upward look. It begins recognizing the origin of it all. The one who conceived it, the one who ordered everything to bring it to pass and willingly offered himself to be the savior of the world. It lifts our minds to consider the wonder of it, the greatness of him. And to bow down and say, glory to God in the highest. Glory to God in the highest. We don't get it. Our view of God is so small. Our view of Christ is so limited. Glory to God in the highest, they tell us. Lift up your eyes. Lift up your hearts. Thirdly, the birth of the Savior will accomplish peace. It will accomplish peace because we are told, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. On earth peace, goodwill toward men. The peace referred to here is that fullness of blessing which the Savior would bring and does bring to this day. And is essentially a synonym for salvation. And I don't invent that myself. That's exactly how it's declared by the Apostle Peter in Acts chapter 10, verse 36, where he records the word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. Preaching peace. What did Jesus preach? He preached the gospel. He preached repentance. He preached the kingdom of God. He went out and preached. And he summarizes it in the term preaching peace. Preaching peace. Peace is the heart of what the incarnation brings to men. Peace is the goal by reason of the incarnation. Glory to God in the highest. Glory to God first and foremost. But peace on earth. The prophet prophesied, as we've already said in Isaiah 9 verse 7, of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Peace constantly. Extending peace. That's what he's going to do through his rule and through his reign. And he is do doing it. And there's no end to it. There's no end to it. Every single day, someone experiences this peace. Or oh, they may be in a, a, a nation that's wrecked and wracked by war. They may be. And they may be in a home that's ruined by sin. And they may be in a life that's feeling the consequences of this cursed world. But every day, people like that feeling and experiencing and knowing the saving peace of God every day, all the time throughout the nations as the gospel goes forward countless thousands and tens of thousands are brought to a saving understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ, never forget it and so he is extending his kingdom of his government and peace there shall be no end no, you cannot, you cannot erect a border. <laughs> I'm not to get into politics, but border control and say that certain people aren't going to get in and you're going to build a wall and you're going to say, you can't do that with the gospel. You may achieve it. You may achieve some level of control of your borders with regard to the physical, but you can't do it with the gospel. 
How many have tried? How many? Through their ideology, through the control of their nations, they have tried. They are still trying to this day in North Korea, and God is still saving in that land. You can't stop it. You cannot stop it. But it's absolutely essential, this peace, to experience this peace, it's essential that you live with a view to the glory of God. You can't know the peace without that. And the angel gets, the whole of the angel, angelic host, they get the order right. It's glory to God in the highest first. Then peace, goodwill to men. And so man gets peace through his exaltation and praise of God. You can't separate the activity of praising God from the peace which is promised. You can't, you can't separate it. You can't say you can have peace unconditionally without praising God. Can't be done. Can't be done. Now, I'm not saying that knowing the peace of God and salvation requires works. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying, telling you this. I'm saying to you that anyone who truly knows the saving work of God in their hearts will praise. They will be praising. They know the peace because they are a praising people. They lift up their hearts heavenward. They live in gratitude to God. They are so thankful every day. All oh, that gratitude may waver. Oh, how it wavers. God forgive us. But there is an expression of gratitude to God constantly. Thank you, Lord. Gratitude marks the Christian. If he is anything, he is a person of gratitude toward God. Always lifting his heart. Glory to God in the highest. We are told several times in the New Testament that he is the God of peace. That peace belongs to him. Peace belongs to God. He is the God of peace. There is no peace outside of him. And Jesus then says, as God to his disciples, peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. I give peace. That's what I do. He is the God of peace. I am God. I give you my peace. He gives it to his disciples. But it's exclusively to them, is it not, beloved? Is that not what he's saying to his disciples there, the 11 of them, Judas, gone by this stage? Peace I leave with you, my disciples. My peace I give unto you, my disciples. You have it. The world doesn't have it. The world doesn't know it. The world doesn't even seek for it. But you have it. You have it. Jesus gives peace to his disciples. Why? Why, is it, why are they getting peace? Why? Because they are first giving glory to God. They are. They're giving glory to God in the highest. They're rejoicing in God. They're rejoicing in the Savior. They're exalting the Lamb that is drawn. And I know there's a synergy in it. And I know that there's an understanding that God saves first, but those that he saves will inevitably be a people who face heaven itself, ever looking up in gratitude, always. Indeed, the measure with which a person treasures Christ will reflect the measure of peace in their hearts. So often that's the case. The more they treasure Christ, the more peace they enjoy. Well, I know we can look at our circumstances and events of life and our past and we can look at it and say, I have no peace because of that. Jesus says, my peace I give to you. I give you my peace. That will permeate every experience. That will triumph over every circumstance. My peace. You disciples, in this world, you'll have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. And I've overcome the world in one particular way, within your hearts, my peace is yours. They have no peace. They will not enjoy peace as they are against you, as they hate the gospel you preach. And they oppose you with all of their fervor, yet my peace will reign in your hearts. The covetous person has no peace. The anxious person has no peace. The rebellious person has no peace. All for the same reason. Unbelief. And beloved, let us realize that each one of us, even though we may have faith in Christ and love him, we can all express elements of covetousness, anxiety, and rebellion. And that's whenever the peace begins to fade when we are not enamored with God, with Christ, glory to God, and we don't treasure him and exalt him and make him everything. When we see him for the greatness of who he is and we say, you're greater than everything, Lord. When we realize 
that having my sins forgiven triumphs over every suffering of life, then all I can do is glory to God in the highest. You know what happens? Peace to men. Peace. It is faith that lifts the heart to be given to glorifying God, exalting God, admiring God, cherishing God, loving God. And when it does that, peace triumphs in the heart. Thus, faith which finds its joy in magnifying the Lord results in peace of soul, peace of mind, peace in circumstances, peace with our enemies, peace yes sometimes we are robbed of peace we are but look at what is promised here with the coming saviour glory to God in the highest and on earth peace he's not saying that all the nations will come to peace and there will be no more war Jesus comes later and says that's not going to be the case he makes it expressly clear that before his coming there'll be wars and rumors of wars. There will not be peace. But that does not mean that peace will not reign within the hearts of all who receive him. It will, and it does. And there are countless that testify to it, and I hope you're one of them. That when I give glory to God in the highest, when I am most exalting him, when life isn't about me, in the midst of all that I'm going through, I'm just lifted up before God. And I see Him. And I love Him. And I say, no matter what happens, no matter what happens, I am my beloved's. And he is mine. You can't take that from us. The world can't take what Christ gives. It can't. That's an excuse those that are wanting for faith use. I'm robbed of my peace because of this. No, no, no. You're robbed of your peace because you're not giving glory to God in the highest. This time of the year we are at times placed in a position of seeing our loved ones, families, those of our blood and kith and kin, Sometimes we don't really get on with them. And there's friction. That friction may develop because of a difference of faith and the fact you love the Lord and you love Christ and they don't. Maybe because of that. It may be something else entirely. Maybe friction of a clash of personality. It may be friction because of something that happened in a bygone day. But if you're a child of God here this morning, I want you to hear this. I don't care what they've done. I don't care what has happened. You talk to them, you face them, and you express your faith in Christ before them in a way that they know for a fact that whatever's happened, that you're not holding grudges. I think peace is robbed from many a heart because they hold grudges. Many a professing believer holds grudges. They can't get over something. You know what, you know what that person <clears throat> is failing to see? glory to God in the highest they think they have the right to hold back forgiveness, a spirit of forgiveness an attitude of forgiving and that is rooted in their pride it's glory to themselves, not glory to God Jesus taught very bluntly in Matthew 6 verses 14 and 15 if you forgive men their trespasses your heavenly father will also forgive you but if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now that's as blunt as it can be. You don't forgive, you're not forgiven. <clears throat> Some might interpret that in different ways. They might say, well, you won't, experience the, the, you won't experience the sense of being forgiven as you withhold forgiveness from others. But if you're a child of God, you're always a child of God. Well, I agree with that. I agree with the fact that if you're a child of God, you're always a child of God. But I don't know. What marks the followers of Jesus Christ is that they are so giving glory to him 
No man can do anything to them that so gets rooted into them that they feel that they are in a position whereby they can withhold forgiveness. They can't. Because you know what they see? They see the greatness of God and the lowness of themselves and they see that the, that the, 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 gap, the gulf between them and God is far greater than the gulf between the one who committed the sin and themselves. And so that's nothing. Glory to God in the highest. Glory to God in the highest. He's way up there. And he came way down here and he saved me. And we're peers. And you did something. I'm not going to withhold forgiveness. Faith, beloved. Faith that looks up and sees the glory of God. The glory of God when we see that. Glory to God in the highest. Then there's peace. Peace is the natural outcome. The Apostle Paul writes in Romans 15 verse 13, Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. In believing. When I am not believing, when I am living in rebellion, when I am having an attitude of, that would mark the unbeliever, like withholding forgiveness or some other thing of, of covetousness or whatever it is, even anxiety. Oh, I know some struggle with anxiety and we are all predisposed to different weaknesses and besetting sins, but anxiety is an expression of unbelief. If we can only get glory to God in the highest. Beloved, I'm speaking this as tenderly as I can. There are a number of you and you struggle with worry. Glory to God in the highest. Get your eyes upward. And he who rules over the universe not merely thought of me but actually came to save me. To deal with all my sins. Every last one of them. The small ones apparently just white lies or whatever. Those little ones that seem insignificant to the greatest ones we would have nothing but shame if they were to be portrayed on a wall in this room. We'd probably leave the city and never come back. Yet he forgives. Our time is nearly gone. Turn with me to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, you see the real heart of this peace that Paul expresses in Romans 5. Romans 5 verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, now get the tense there. He is talking to the church, believing people. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Justification. This is this doctrine needs to be rightly understood this morning. It always does. Therefore, being justified. The Savior of the world. How does he save? How does he save? Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior. How does he save? How do sinful men experience that salvation? How do they know it? Here it is. Being justified. Let me make that really simple for you. When you see the word justified, when you hear the word justified, just as if I never sinned. That's the standing, beloved. Therefore being just, therefore being in a condition as if I never sinned. We have peace with God. We have peace with God. But the fact is we did sin and we do sin. So how is this possible? How? How can it be? Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. He will come. He came to seek and to save the lost. 
How does he do that? He set his face as a flint to go to Jerusalem. He must finish the work that his father gave him to do. He must, as he reveals in John 10, lay down his life for the sheep. He must. He must bear their sins on his own body. As Paul expresses elsewhere, he was made sin. I'm made to be just as if I never sinned. He is made to be as if he did sin. And by the transferring of my sin to him and his righteousness to me, we are justified by faith. By faith. What do you mean by faith? By seeing and believing it. By embracing it. By resting in it. By laying hold of it. By saying, yes, this is what I need. I am a sinner before a holy God. No gift this Christmas can take away my sin but this one. And he was born this day in the city of David who is a savior, who is a savior. He takes my sin. He bears my sin. P P Peter says he bore our sins upon his own body on that tree. He bore our sins. He takes my sins so that it can be said of me, I am justified. And it's by faith. I lay hold on it. I see the cross. I see the savior. Glory to God in the highest. I rest in him. I lean on him. I hope in him, by faith, we have peace with God. By faith, by faith. Oh, preacher, what must I do? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. What must I do? Rest. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom, that is through Christ, also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. In other words, we stand in a position of grace. We stand in a position of grace. How? Through Christ. A position of grace. Not judgment. Not condemnation. A position of grace. That's where we stand. And why? Or what do we do, rather, when we stand here? What do we do when we stand in this position of grace? Do we allow the circumstances of life to rob us of this? To cause us to be melancholy and depressed and discouraged and downcast and feel like there's the end of the world that's going on in my life right now? No. By whom also we have access by faith into this grace when we stand and rejoice. Glory to God in the highest. Rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Yes, rejoice. <laughs> Glory to God in the highest. A Savior is born. It is Christ the Lord. The question then is, do you have this peace? Do you have it? Do you have this gift of God, which is eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord? You know, Jesus taught, and I'll end with this. Jesus taught his disciples and when he taught them this, he was given an expression of who will get the peace and who will not. In Luke chapter 10, he talked about them going out and engaging them in ministry. And he sends them two and two into every city and place. In Luke chapter 10, we'll read verse, from verse 3. He says, Go your ways. Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. Carry neither purse nor scrip nor shoes, and salute no man by the way. And into whatsoever house ye enter, first say, Peace be to this house. Peace to men. That's what the angels said. And if the Son of Peace be there, your peace shall rest upon it. If not, it shall turn to you again. If they don't embrace, by faith, the son of peace. If they don't rest in him, if they reject him, if they remain in a state of unbelief, no peace. None. The peace will come back to you again. They won't have it. You walk out that door, they have none of the peace, I promise. None. 
the peace, goodwill to men assumes faith that will embrace it. So do you believe? Could you say of the habitation of your heart and soul and mind that you have taken in the son of peace? You've taken him in. You've embraced him by faith. You're not relying on works. You're not relying on religion. You're not relying on church. You're not relying on anything. You're resting in Jesus Christ. You've taken him in. Stripped of everything else. You if I have Jesus, Jesus only. That's all I need. You have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. I was reading this week, Thomas Watson, speaking on contentment. <laughs> it's worth reading. <laughs> but there was something that I thought would be appropriate to end with here today. As we consider what has come to us, Watson said this, speaking of Christ, he is wisdom to teach us, righteousness to acquit us, sanctification to adorn us. He is that royal and princely gift. He is the bread of angels, the joy and triumph of saints. He is all in all. He is everything. That's it. Watson was right. Do I need wisdom? He is my wisdom. Do I need righteousness? He is my righteousness. Do I need sanctification? He is my sanctification. He is that royal princely gift. And on to you, who is born this day in the city of David, a saviour, who is Christ the Lord. Glory to God in the highest. Peace, goodwill to men. Let's bow together in prayer.